Hello. So first of all, you know, I took that logo because I liked it and watched padlock on it. So now, now we've got now we've got a bit of a secure back we are. <laughs> exactly. So who am I? Jared Henson, security architect at Control Plane. Uh, and here, as David said, just to discuss conceptually the security, not not deep down, having such code base. I mean, from some of the presentations today, I can tell it's already changed. So <laughs> the security, some bits in here may be true as of maybe a week ago. Uh, but yeah. So just to note, um, Web3 can depend heavily on Web1 security. So Web1, I say, is the read-only web, or syntactic, and that came from uh, the term of pro sorry, programming syntax to interact at a lower level with just your standard read-only pages. Web2 was your read-write web, so, and also dominated by the big tech companies. You know, your Facebook, Google, they're all dominated. Some people call it the social web. And then Web3, which I'm going to say is our space right now, um, decentralized, and that's moving away from the, the big tech and, and everything in all one central place. Not the cult-like movements where people think they can do whatever they want, whenever they want, and get away with everything on Web3, um, but it's more to you know, open up more doors and allow people to do more with less. So what do we know so far on security? The, I've separated it into four categories here. You've got the CSPs, um, so you know, your GCP. CSP is Cloud Service Provider. So you've got Google Cloud, AWS, Alibaba, Azure, IBM, should you touch it, and you know. Uh, so they provide decentralized services. Not actually decentralized, they're technically centralized. Because underneath they've got health and lo health monitoring, logging, self-repair, and they're doing a lot of stuff which you don't see, but it doesn't actually create a true decentralized service. Um, however, they do use secure enclaves. Um, all of them do. Uh, they have the power to, they have industrial kit. Google make their own from the bottom up, you know, the TPM chips and everything. Um, so yeah, they're, they're virtually centralized. Then you've got your web peer-to-peer, -peer, sorry, web two peer-to-peer, your Napster, Nutella, your BitTorrent. Um, so for example, BitTorrent was an unstructured peer-to-peer, -peer, which meant any node could join. There was no structure. But now it's semi, it's hybrid, because they've added the decentralized data discovery mechanism. Um, and also, if you've ever torrented legally, um, you would know that there's trackers, and you, know, you can see and, and find certain seeds as well. Um, competitors. I'm going to touch on just one, actually, um, Gollum. So Gollum have been in the space a while. Uh, they do compute over data. They do it distributed. They do apps on decentralized. And yeah, they've got a big base already. There's a lot of stats. I won't go into too much detail. However, they haven't got a reputation system either. They haven't got any verification system. Um, in fact, it's just one-to-one. -one. They could ask me for a result. I could give them something they don't actually know it's true. However, they did have secure enclaves built in using Intel SGX. So the implementation was ready. Um, GitHub is full of some of their repos you can take a look at. But they decided not to spend more resources or money on it, mainly because Intel discontinued SGX for consumer CPUs from the 10th generation. So only your big players of industrial CPUs can, you know, industrial kit can start doing this sort of stuff. And I mention that just because I'll get, end up touching a bit of secure enclaves, SGX, later on. Um, like, Gollum is only public data. With Bakuya, we're looking at potentially moving on to private data. Um, and th th there's a lot of security stuff analysis I did on Gollum, and the susceptible to DDoS on the central network. It, it's exactly, it's not even fully decentralized, and they claim it is. There is a central ne um, network that acts as a proxy. So you connect to it and it networks you through. Um, so yeah, spam that and, and they're gone. Uh, Bakuyao, so that's why I'm here. It's, at the moment, it's a true and structured peer-to-peer -peer from what I understood. If it's changed and the architecture's changed, oops, I'm ignoring it. Uh, <laughs> and that's decentralized and there's, you know, there's big wishes to move to um, private data as well as public data because it will open up a lot more customers. And getting it wrong is expensive. People ignore security, people get annoyed with security, it slows people down. Um, but if it's incorporated from the beginning, it doesn't actually slow you down because you've secured yourself more than trying to fix stuff. And you know, as you can see, they're, they're huge numbers. Most recent one I put on was the running network, $624 million. 
And you see your total up there, you've got 2.2 billion or if you're deep in Web3 now and you start to use Ethereum as more of your uh, coin of tracking, that other guy you go, I added it. But yeah, the past two months, $977 million has, has been taken, all because of really, really silly, silly security mistakes. Um, in fact, Badger, Dow on there, 119 million, that was actually a GUI problem, and there's something to note. And, and yeah, just to say first, actually, this should be a discussion I'm hoping for like the hackathon or maybe some unconferences. There's a lot around security we need to discuss. But with Badger, that was essentially a Cloudflare problem. Um, somebody got access to their Cloudflare, adjusted some keys, and essentially did something called ice phishing. Um, and essentially anyone visiting their website, uh, they were told to connect their wallet, and really they just gave all their permissions to somebody else and siphoned. So that, that's, again, a supply chain attack, something from Web2 that Web3 needs to take hold of. Uh, yes, so examples of some Web3 threats. I won't go through all of them, I just wanted to put some up. Some of them you may not think are relevant to Bacchial, which is true, maybe some price oracles, um, but in the potential future where we look at smart contracts, that's when a whole different attack landscape opens up. Um, griefing, however, and infrastructure are more likely to happen with Bacchial, especially griefing, actually malicious jobs, you know, your disgruntled nodes, Ransomware, I put ransomware on, it's an interesting one. Ransomware on the blockchain has not actually been seen yet. It's been seen in a way where people have used smart contracts to pay ransomware providers as a service. Um, so if somebody, if somebody manages to get a crypto payment to decrypt, that smart contract says the owner of the ransomware will get X amount, and it's an easy way to hide. However, could Bacariel, you know, be abused to use their network for malicious compute? For example, how would you detect that? How, how would we? Stop that, can't just switch it off like you would in a uh, normal situation. Um, yeah. What do you mean by malicious compute though? Is that like so in this, attacking others? Well, in this sense, when I was talking about the ransomware, I meant using the power of the Bakari network. So using other nodes to do malicious activity. Yeah. Whether that's C to, you know, command and control, uh, you could do data exfiltration, you're processing, you could wrap it around Bacchial so many times in a similar way that you can wrap stolen Ethereum through Tornado and lose its wallet. Modern tech stack, you compromise no matter what. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, I'm going to go very high level and light. Um, there, there's a deeper report. This is more of a high level presentation on it. Um, so cryptography and confidential computing. I just explain zero knowledge proof in a very highest level. You know, say that I've got a green ball and a red ball, but I'm colorblind and I, I can't tell the difference. Uh, and I'll be asking, let's say, Luke in front of me to tell me, as I have my hands behind my back, which one, you know, is it the same or is it different? I still won't know the color, whereas Luke will be able to see the color, assuming he's not colorblind as well. Otherwise, we'll be in a loop. <laughs> um, and then I, I will some, I'll somewhat know that it's different, they're not the same, but I won't know exactly why. And, that's a very high level zero knowledge proof. Um, so I'm the zero knowledge and Luke would be the prover. So compute over private data, what well, homomorphic, functional, and what I've named authorized decryption, which is something to look into again, hackathon, I want to discuss it. So homomorphic, what we could use it for, you know, you're really sensitive health records, um, Intelligence agencies would, would definitely want to use stuff like that. Medical, you know, hospitals won't start putting up client, client, uh, patient data, um, especially depending where you are in the world. I mean, GDPR uh, would cover so much that you'd be screwed if you're processing that unencrypted. Um, you got functional, so that's it's okay to know the answer, just not how it's operated, what, what the actual data was, and, and the algorithms running on it. And then authorize of name, which is semi-private, hide from casual viewers, and it's okay to compute um, to see. So homomorphic encryption for Bacchial, examples of jobs being run, uh, <laughs> examples of uh, jobs being run with homomorphic encryption um, could be put on the GitHub repo, but I believe it should be left to the user, personally, to take control of homomorphic encryption. We should be able to provide the functionality. We should be able to provide some example jobs um, some examples of how-tos and, and guides. But ultimately, that should be up to the, the user. We shouldn't take on that security risk, nor all the logic. Um, functional encryption for Bacchial, so that's a private key. 
let me explain Functional a bit more. Um, it's used in spam filters for email. So essentially, it's a private key that has a function built in within it. Um, so let's say everyone's salaries in here is in one spreadsheet, um, and I wanted to access my salary information. None of you want me to see all of yours. So I could be provide a pri private key based off the master key that has a function to decrypt only Jared Henderson and all my details. I still won't be able to see anyone else's. So that's how, for example, Gmail will check for spam. It doesn't see the content. It just provides a function and gets a Boolean result on top of whether it's spam or not. Um, and authorized decryption. So this is semi-academic, but I think potentially possible after being introduced uh, recently to uh, lit protocol. I think that came through David, actually. Um, and they're essentially a decentralized key management system, and it's based on and or rules. For example, if name is Jared and has wallet address 123 and, I don't know, doesn't own an NFT, for example, I could then get a key. Um, and the way I thought this could be used is we could have encrypted data from all customers on Bacoyal and use something like a decentralized key management system to provide the key to the compute node. So the compute node will request the key. It could check. Um, Bacchial could have a module to check. If the compute node has won that job, it's got the correct user, and then it has access to this data. It can pull it down and um, decrypt it, do the work. But it could also reverse and do the encryption, put the encryption key back into the decentralized key management system, and then the user will be able to decrypt their result with that key, essentially hiding it end to end. That would definitely require a bit of a, a discussion and hackathon. It sounds simple, but it's not. Um, that's essentially what I meant by authorized decryption. And we've got secure multi-party computation. Again, another simple way to explain this is there's three people with their salaries. You've got Alice, Bob, and Carol. Um, what Alice will do, she'll give, keep 50 to herself. She'll give Bob 30, Carol 20. Same pattern for Bob. Bob will, keep, Bob will give Alice minus 80, 100 to himself, and Carol will get 180. And that will all add up to their uh, total salary. And then at the end, it's all added together, and, it will, and that total amount is divided by the amount of uh, users, and then you'll get the average. So unless Bob and Carol work together, you know, <laughs> they can work it out. But on a bigger scale, it'll be much harder to deduce these values. It's quite a simple, simple way of, of getting a result. And it's, you may have heard this in the millionaires problem. Six millionaires, they want to know who has the most money without um, saying how much. And it's the same thing. Give all their money, and the answer will be, I don't know, Bob. Trust the execution environment, important piece for I reckon Bacchial's future, um, both for the requester and the compute node. So in this case, the host is the compute node. The guest is the requester. Um, why? Because you're running other unknown compute on other people's infrastructure. It protects the requester and the compute provider. The host essentially, like it's on slide, doesn't trust the guest, nor does the guest trust the host. Complete zero trust. They don't know each other, don't like each other, but they're doing work together. And why is it, so yeah, I'm sorry, trust execution environment. So you can see how much it removes. Each extra layer on the left-hand side, which is traditional, adds extra room for security vulnerabilities. Whereas in your trust execution environment, you essentially got the three, CPU, that middleware to interact, and then the application itself. Um, so you can do attestation and cryptographic proof that a trusted execution environment is run. Uh, you can also check current state of memory and registers to make sure it's zeroed out, so there's no, there's no tampering done. And keys are baked into the hardware and manufacturing time by the vendors, um, and the public key, is public key is stored in the vendor's uh, database. And what you could do is then use that to check if a compute node is running a trusted execution environment, check it's not tampered with, and run the job. Now. Conceptually, you could have two types of compute nodes. You could have one that runs on, you know, for the Firecracker Ignite, the Docker, or you could have people that also register themselves as a, a T compute node, and, and they can provide this sort of execution. And linking to WASM, um, so when I was first looking at the security back here, I was only aware of the Firecracker Ignite and uh, the Docker, but now with WASM, you, there's actually a Red Hat project called Enarx. 
and they essentially do this for you. It's NRX run a WASM binary. Um, it does all the checks locally, checks the keys. If, it, if there's something wrong with the enclave, it won't run. Just, it just won't touch it. Um, there's probably possibility to use an NRX API to remotely, uh, to remotely call and, and run. However, that does open up network communications, and you, know, you start to get into the centralized area of decentralized, where people create decentralized apps and tools, but then suddenly they get centralized by adding one, one feature because it's a, a fail. There's also a tool called T-Lime. They can do TPM attestation. And T-Lime's mission is to make TPM technology essentially easily accessible. Um, and it was invented for use on remote machines um, and devices on the edge. And there's three parts to it. There's a verifier, a registrar, and an agent. The verifier verifies the integrity state of the machine. The registrar is a database of all the um, hosts and the TPM vendor keys. We could do that in a decentralized way. It depends. You could use a blockchain for that. It's essentially one big database, if you think of it in a very high level. And then the agent, which is deployed to all these remote machines and you know checks that it's constantly secure, there's no leakage, um, and then it will only release secret keys when it's done its pass. Yes? Is there um, uh, two questions? The first is, you know, with Intel dropping out, is there, like, across the security community, is it assumed that T's will continue, or is it like, you know, folks are mostly seeing it go down? It's actually going up. Uh, I'll move to, so actually, I'll move to the next slide. So, you got Microsoft, IBM, Google, AWS, and Red Hat and Arcs I mentioned. Everyone's playing in this space. Encrypted data and rest in transit is solved, but encryption use isn't. Um, you can see the big players are playing it. There's a lot on it. The open source, a mix of open source and non-open source. AWS is actually the only one that's not a member of the Confidential Computing Consortium, whereas the rest of them are. Um, so, and that's because I think AWS use their own specific stuff. It's no SGX, it's no SEV. Um, but the interesting one about Red Hat NRX is because it does support WASM binaries natively. So there's a threat modeling piece. This is uh, the bit that drove a lot of um, the work that was done. This is the high, high level conceptual diagram that Luke and Kai uh, displayed. They had it a bit lower down. This is the highest we went. This is just, you know, you've got your requester, your compute, your job, your bidding, the, the most simple. Um, we focused all of our threat modeling on this model, and the current potential threats identified have been separated into those following six categories. Uh, to iterate, we didn't come uh, cover the code base. It wasn't in scope. And again, a lot of this we should be able to flesh out in a hackathon. I, I, I wrote this presentation layout in a way that we could sit down and you know, smash together, because um, everyone has their own skill sets to be able to bring a lot more. How's that looking? Uh, it's a bit small. Okay. The top right is the diagram, and the bit highlighted in red is, is to visualize where we're covering here. And this is the submitting the job. So we don't know everything yet of how someone will submit a job. But conceptually, you know, a user might be able to spam multiple. They may have a lack of funds. Do we know if they're going to pay first or they're going to pay after? Is it going to be like Gollum, where they actually set out in JSON or YAML the amount they'll pay? per minute of processing, I think it is. So do we have a, uh, an escrow and, and, and store that money first? How much do we take? What happens if there's price changes? There's a lot a user could do with funds or the price of the funds. Um, and then schedule a breakout is an interesting one. It's the supply chain. You know, a user input allows an attacker to break out. Um, and that, that can link back, again, to your Web2 stuff, your, your traditional injection attacks. I think of SQL injection is still around now. It happens all the time. These things can still happen. Just because we're in decentralized doesn't mean everything changes and we're all secure. It's a misconception, actually, that people think something utilizing blockchain, something in this new Web3 space is actually secure. There's a reason why so many things are getting hacked and you know the amount of money is being lost, which I showed at the start. Um, bidding on a job. So, you know, the user is submitted. Now we're bidding. Well, the compute node is bidding and deciding whether to bid on that job. And this one is interesting. I mentioned secure MPC and a control for quite a few of it because are the computer nodes going to see each other's bids? Um, if they can, you know, they can start doing undercutting. 
they can, you know, they can put, or you can impersonate other nodes. Um, how do we identify if the compute node is uh, correct from that provider? Are we going to use some sort of cryptographic pseudo identity? Are we going to use you know other wallet addresses linked? But if the wallet address is linked, there's nothing stops you from spinning one up. I could create a MetaMask wallet in about a second by just clicking on the extension and a new one. Um, and then also false bids. So using, let's say I compromised some node and I started creating a load of false bids to severely under underbid on a lot of work will actually cause that compromised node to lose money because the compute cost is a lot more than what the user is, is paying. Um, and a la another one on supply chain. So this is this a massive key one as well, similar to how Badger was uh, knocked out. So if the source code is, is modified, you know, never accept a bid. Um, how would we do that? You know, you sign commits in GitHub, functional dynamic testing, uh, and signed release binaries. So I left that one to last because Gollum, again, I'm, I'm just mentioning Gollum just so we can keep comparing security and something they lack in, actually. But signed release binaries will allow uh, the requester or the compute node to, to run and know that the code has not been modified. Because if we put the security mechanisms in the source code, nothing stops them from downloading it and removing that code and, and modifying. And I sat down for a while trying to work out how to stop that. And I could, at the time, anything of these signed release binaries with this open source state. Technically, 51% attack applies to that. If there's one compute node and owns 51% of the network, that also becomes a verify issue, but I'll, I'll hold that one. Um, requester impersonation, it'd allow an attacker to accept high or low bids. That's also similar, I mentioned, for the user bidding. Um, lack of funds, again, it's another one. I think it's quite important. If the user doesn't have enough funds, either someone's going to be screwed and it's probably the computer not being paid. So how, how do we do that? Are we going to use escrow? Are we going to do some sort of zero knowledge proof? So we don't know how much our user has. No one wants to display, here is my bank account, but I can afford to buy a bottle of water. Um, you'll be able to provide some sort of proof. Yeah, I've got enough money, but you don't know how much. Um, and it's this sort of implementation is, is what I see going forward. Um, and the, hmm? I just say, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, the user, so denying all bids is an interesting one. So the user never accepting a bid from a compute node. So we know the compute node gets, uh, may lose money if it starts being grief, griefing. What about the user? Well, if I put something out there and just can constantly deny bids, it doesn't really cause harm. It's just very annoying. And if it's on a big scale, it could you know, demoralize compute nodes and people will leave. Um, and like I've got some questions there, like is bidding optimized for better compute or cheaper cost? Just have this picture of a slightly <laughs> sad compute. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and that question there, bidding optimized for compute or cheapest cost, that also links to are we going to have commute, compute nodes with trusted execution environments? Is there a different? Are they going to be able to see? Can you pick? Can you choose? Is it random? There's a lot that, that will cover that. Um, Executing the job, so yes, one, because this is the second slide. It's quite, it's the, it's one where everything goes wrong. Um, there's one not on there, and that's, for example, let's say I've instructed a compute node to do some work on a large data set, um, but that data set is updated, but not very much. And I use the same compute node because they're trusted. I, I just like using them, and they do a good price. Um, what stops the compute node spoofing the previous evidence of work? Because you could say this, the computer has done the work, but he's just using the previous evidence of work uh, for the future ones. So you, it, that starts to ruin that verification um, method. It's something I thought of um, and discussed with a colleague doing this work, and it's really, yeah, it's really good. In fact, I didn't think of it. He thought of it. I won't take it under there. <laughs> um, false answers. Compute node providing false answers. The verification system we've gone over quite a few times today. Reputation system. Um, deterministic jobs of a large quorum of nodes, but that's expensive. Who's going to pay for it? Um, retaining job data. So that's a private data issue. Obviously, with public data at the moment, it's not too big of a scary risk for us. Um, however, with private data, that is a risk. And again, to mention Gollum. 
they actually retain data for 30 days on each compute node uh, in the case that they're going to do another job on that data, um, and then it's automatically cleaned. Obviously, that's something we will not do and can't do. They only do it just so they save um, the uh, and better efficiency on detaching and attaching images. Um, any other big ones on there? Sensitive algorithms, yeah, so it's not just the data. What if I'm sending a sensitive algorithm that's proprietary uh, to run on Bacchial? What stops Compute Node from seeing that algorithm and, and stealing that? Code. Exactly, yeah. And that's, again, homomorphic encryption, nah, you know, probably 10 years away from really fast, efficient. They're used. You can do it. Uh, it's not like you can just do it really quickly. It'll take ages for big data sets. So again, trusted execution environments, being able to put that data into somewhere that is separate. The computer node should not have access and read or write, and we should also check that it's zeroed out memory and registries uh, beforehand. Slide two of execute jobs. Um, so sensitive data, again, uh, that's the PCI DSS, GDPR, the stuff that I was mentioning, where, you, know, you mentioned legal content. What, what, what are we doing on that? Are we going to put it into terms and conditions, go policy-wise, you know, terms of use, similar to AWS, that even have terms of use covering zombie, apocalypse. I don't know if you've seen that. It's actually in there. Um, <clears throat> content inspection. Uh, I know, David, you said it's separate and already covered. I'm assuming it might come under that itself. Um, go your malicious jobs again, malicious network usage. Uh, we could also use in executing jobs zero-knowledge proof to prove that you've actually computed the job without sharing the results that others would copy. Um, and that covers the copying answers. I know you already mentioned it, Kai and Luke, in your presentation with the, you know, encrypting it, um, depending on speed or, or options. Obviously, you can use that built in, um, or zero-knowledge proof. Or the question I put, we put forward was, are the results only published once paid? And that saves that encryption piece, for example, yeah, or wherever it's stored. Until it's paid, then the results are shown, and then it removes that. Uh, copying. So yeah, that actually reminds me, that's similar to the ransomware one I mentioned of, you know, using it for malicious network, but I could also, let's say I have a huge zombie network from a remote administration tool, a rat. I've got a load of hosts from people I've infected since 10 years ago. Stay quiet. What happens if I suddenly install a Bacchial compute node on every single one of them? Is that an immediate 51% attack? Is that also who's liable? Uh, there's a lot of a lot of things to cover on that one. And that's where you could do that attestation uh, on the trust execute environments uh, with the keys built into the hardware and the proof of ownership using zero knowledge proof. Again, that's pseudo anonymity. You don't know who I am, but you know it's mine and it's, it's legitimate. Verifying results. Again, another one, zero knowledge proof. It keeps coming up uh, without giving away the answer. So, for example, if I was doing the red and green ball behind my back, which is a red ball? So never give the answer, it's zero knowledge um, proof. If that's contested, then we know there's a false answer or a wrong answer. Um, lack of funds is, a, is a repeated again. The user doesn't have enough funds for the jobs at the time of payment. Um, how's that linked in with the verification? Is there, is there payment there? What if they, ne what if they never verify? Does, if it costs to verify, why would they? Um, <clears throat> What if they just use, get the results and you know, never reply back? Um, it's probably better to pay per processing. And if that payment isn't being paid, uh, just stop. At least the computer node doesn't lose out. The only person who loses out there is the user. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, an annoying griefing one was withholding verification. Just outright not verifying in order to prevent payment to the computer node. So they've done the job, and they've got the answer, but they're not paying the compute node, because the compute node relies on that reputation or verification. And payment. So payment's a hard one to cover, uh, primarily because we're not touching the code base. There's no smart contracts involved yet. Um, but the two standard ones, you could, you could bear or ball back all. So I could, if I had enough power or enough funds, or I had access to some sort of whale client, um, let's say Elon Musk was my friend, I just, have him to, I just have to have him tweet one thing about Bakugao to make it go up or down, and essentially I could pay less to get more done, um, or end up having my tokens worth more once I've been paid by the user, and they've essentially then overpaid. 
I know the market changes, but obviously it's manipulated that quick. You have that slippage. It's similar to how price oracle attacks happen. Um, an empty wallet. You know, the job request has an empty wallet before accepting bids. What happens there? Because then if they provide false answers, they usually have a cost. You know, they won't just lose reputation, they'll also get fined, essentially. If it's empty, how are you going to find them? Do we have to do a payment escrow from the other side? Uh, again, how do you know people can afford jobs they're requesting? Same things keep coming up. So in summary, covering those high level uh, from zero knowledge proof, homomorphic encryption, functional encryption, secure multi-party computation, and trusted execution environments. So the protocol, that's the interface and the interaction, smart contracts, all that lovely stuff. With zero knowledge proof, yeah, it's applicable. The request uh, proving they have enough money and how much. With secure multi-party computation, that can include your, your blind bids. Compute notes that, you know, they, a computer node could be saying how much computers provide in X window at X price. Um, for example, if that feature is allowed, if, if people can walk away and accept bids based on some sort of criteria, SMPC will A, provide privacy on the bids, but also allow that extra feature of automating accepting uh, uh, bids. Um, it could also you know, cover sensitive information um, and allow the, the back of system to automate it. And that's really important for protocols in Web3 because it allows you to step back. We should be able to leave the back of network and it doesn't fall down. Obviously not leave the company and disappear, but we should be able to step back. The implementation, so that's the, the Golang code. Um, not much done really, as I already mentioned. The user can remove it. As Kai said, you should be able to just join, so you can't really just willy-nilly sign up with a, a signed binary. Um, you can maybe use zero knowledge proof to prove that it's the back of your code base you're running uh, as a compute node. Um, and definitely yes to trusted execution environments. So protecting the compute node from unknown jobs running on the infrastructure. And consumer jobs, this one is important and applicable to private data. Um, we don't really need this, any of this actually uh, in the case of public data, but zero knowledge proof can provide that verification a job is done or is correct um, or is a fail. Homomorphic and functional encryption, so that allows you to process the private and semi-private data. Again, that, that links, I haven't put the authorized decryption in there because we coined that term ourselves, but that links a lit protocol. Um, idea of having that distributed key management centralized, decentralized, sorry, and then utilizing that with Bakoyao to encrypt and decrypt uh, customer data on compute nodes, um, sending it back and forth. So it's not homomorphic, it's not functional really, but it just adds that extra layer of security from side channel attacks and protecting both the host and the uh, user. And then Trusted execution environments, it can somewhat protect uh, data and algorithms from the host and the compute node, um, and that is the job. So, you know, all private code, like, like I mentioned, it allows us to, to run these sort of jobs but provide some sort of security to the user uh, to know that their you know, algorithms and IP aren't going to be taken, let alone the data. Sometimes the algorithm's worth more than the data it's being run on. And that is me. That's it. Thank you.